Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Brian Fariso, the director of the Portland Art Museum, and it's a great honor to have you all here. I know we have people from throughout the country. I, I must admit, I was in Miami Beach all week at Art Miami Basel, and I got back late last night, so this is sort of refreshing to get back to my place and a place of intellectual uh, investigation and curiosity as well as a little bit of rain. So it's great to be here this morning and, um, and to have this event at our museum because these are the types of events that really, I believe, uh, strongly reiterate why we need our museums and why we need to have them um, supported at the highest level as we show important works of art and generate new knowledge. Um, obviously, this event would not take place if it wasn't for Mary and Chini Coles. Incredible collectors, incredible philanthropists, and incredible donors. Um, it's been my privilege to get to know them, thanks to many on my team. Um, we've had uh, an exhibition here that has really been quite remarkable and uh, something that will be um, remembered for generations. So a big thanks to Mary and Chini for their support and for their <laughs> generosity. As, as I mentioned, uh, this exhibition shows some work for the first time ever in the United States. It also presents new ideas, thanks to, I think, the curatorial team and the scholars behind this, led by Mary Beth Grable, as well as research uh, that will serve generations. There's no doubt about it, this museum has and aspires to continue its commitment to generating important exhibitions, new knowledge, and continue to educate generations about the importance of art, and in particular, Japanese art, given our location in the world. I'm very grateful also to Mildred Schnitzer. Um, she endowed uh, a program here at the museum over 20 years ago to allow us to continue to have lectures such as this, and this is being supported by the Schmidt Mildred Schnitzer Fund, and a big thanks to her daughters, uh, Dory Schnitzer, Susan Schnitzer Marks, as well as Jean Schnitzer Marks, as well as the Asian Art Council, which contributed to that fund. So I would like to recognize Mildred Schnitzer, her daughters in the Asian Art Council of this museum for their support. Thank you very, very much. We've also been generously supported by Bonhams, as well as the Metropolitan Foundation for Far Eastern Studies, which has allowed us to invite and bring a number of graduate students here today. So a big thanks to them. I appreciate their support as well. Two other recogn recognitions that I'd like to give um, on that uh, among our team is Jeannie Ken Motso. She is the Japan Foundation Assistant Curator of Japanese Art, as well as Sangha Kim, the Coles Curatorial Fellow in Asian Art. Both have been incredibly important to our museum, our curatorial team, and they're an absolute joy to work with. Thank you both, Jeannie and Sangha. And for those of you who are close to our Asian Art Council or members, you know that Jan Quivy makes it all happen. Um, she has been uh, with this museum for a number of years and has been critical to today's success as well as the exhibition's success, as well as for us getting to know the Coles. Jan, thank you for your, all that you do. And with that, it gives me a great privilege and an honor to bring up to the stage our curator, Mary Beth Grable. Good morning. Among the many ways that we could have organized an exhibition from the Coles Collection, we chose poetic imagination as a theme. In no small part, because it illuminates an interesting and important narrative across almost the entire history of Japanese art. But even more so, because it seems to me a very strong current in the works that the Coles have chosen to collect. What makes a painting Poetic, what is poetry in literature? Um, in Stephen Carter's volume, Traditional Japanese Poetry and Anthology, in his introduction, he quotes the early modernist poet Ezra Pound, 
who lived 1885 to 1972, an American author, um, who defined great literature as simply language charged to the utmost possible degree, and poetry the most concentrated form of verbal expression. Pound was himself a serious student of classical Chinese and Japanese poetry. Although I found these quotations long after the exhibition was planned and the works selected, and the selections were made by the contributors to the catalog of different sections, I think they offer a useful approach to the exhibition. Uh, just as waka poetry, traditional Japanese poetry, is itself brief, indirect, and usually elegant in expression, so are most of the paintings on view. And just as poetry leaves a great deal unsaid, inviting, even demanding, our active engagement, sort of a dialogue with the poet to complete the thought, these paintings are often tantalizingly suggestive rather than declarative. Many of them reveal their secrets slowly, only after sustained looking. I think there's an interesting parallel there to Cheney Cole's personality. It takes a while to get to know him. He's very, very slow to reveal his secrets. Um, but the longer and the more one engages in conversation, the more profound and the more rewarding the, the friendship becomes. Um, Brian has offered a number of thanks already, and uh, I just want to add two more. I want to thank him as our director for his unflagging support for this long-term project that has taken me away from my everyday duties. He is one of the very few museum directors who believes that research is central to the curatorial enterprise. Likewise, Donald Urquhart, who is our director of collections and exhibitions, propped me up every time I faltered with encouragement and wise solutions. Um, in truth, every department in the museum played a key role in making the exhibition work as also the uh, symposium itself. And so to Brian's list of colleagues, I want to add, especially today, the education department uh, and the uh, project today being led by Stephanie Parrish, our director of adult programs. So please, a shout out for Stephanie Parrish. Um, now some logistics. Um, I hope you all have a copy of the schedule in hand, but we'll have two talks. The plan is that each talk is 35 minutes followed by a 10 minute period for Q&A uh, and then a break. And um, if your destination is the restrooms, they are outside at the top of the stairs and to your left. Then we'll have the third talk um, and then break for lunch. And um, without further ado then, I'd like to invite to the stage my dear friend and colleague, whom I've known even longer than I've known Joshua Mostow, <laughs> um, the remarkable Sadako Oki. Before I start my talk, I would like to express my thanks to Mary and Jenny Coles for their lifelong interest in Japanese, um, or actually Asian art first, you know, Chinese art first, and Japanese art, and their generosity in supporting this um, comprehensive and significant exhibition. I would also like to thank them on behalf of the Yale University Art Gallery, where I have been working the past 20 years. And they have been, well, we have been beneficiaries of Mary and Jenny Cole's generosity. Thank you. I would also like to say thank you to Mary Beth, whom I've known since my graduate school days at the University of Michigan in 1970s, and that makes us old, hopefully, but that's reality. She has worked so hard, and many times you know, we worried about her, but happily we have come to this point of standing here in the middle of this symposium and celebrating the beautiful and memorable exhibition, Poetic Imagination in Japanese Art. Well done, Mary Beth. Thank you.
In my introductory writing for the forthcoming catalog, Visual Poetry in the Cause Collection of Japanese Calligraphy, I've observed that calligraphy in the collection appears in diverse forms, and many as ins you know, inscriptions on paintings. In the exhibition, there's no separate section on calligraphy, and yet we will find calligraphy works in all four divisions. Waka and Kotri tradition, ink painting and the Zen milieu, literary culture and modern innovations. The collection is comprehensive. This is the oldest example in the Kohl's collection. Commonly nicknamed Yakegyo or Burnt Sutra, this is a rare example that survived the fire that broke out at the Nigatsudo Hall of the Todaiji Temple in 1667. It was partly damaged, hence it is nicknamed the Burnt Sutra. Written in the standard Chinese characters called Kanji script in Japanese, the Yakegyo is only a small section of a much longer hand scroll copy of the Flower Garland Sutra. The mounting was done by Hiroshi Sugimoto, a contemporary artist. One of the say, newest example is this avant-garde work. This was drawn in 1961 by Inoue Yuichi and titled Shout or the Cuts. As I began researching this comprehensive collection, I found myself studying the entire history of Japanese calligraphy, as well as <laughs> linguistic complexity in relationship with poetry. This intricacy, viewed in a modern historical context, has challenged many Japanese contemporary artists. In this short presentation, I've decided to concentrate more on the visual and technical side rather than the poetic side. Other scholars here are better experts in literature than I. I will attempt to examine the calligraphy in the Coles collection by paying attention to form and line. First, let us brush up on the history and the linguistic background of Japanese calligraphy. As Joshua Mosto, the keynote speaker yesterday, laid down the ground information yesterday, so you know, some may overlap. As many of you know, the Japanese language belongs to a totally different language from the Chinese. As the Japanese did not have their own written language, they had to improvise, making kana syllabaries to supplement their grammatical needs. This caused a linguistic complexity and also gave the Japanese written language, namely calligraphy, a visual intricacy. Let us briefly take a look at this uh, abbreviated history of the development of Chinese writing styles. Here, i just like you to remember just only two important things. I don't quiz you on this, so don't worry. <laughs> One is that before sophisticated brush was invented during the Han Dynasty, let's say about the turn of the first century, thousands of years of development in character forms had already taken place. Second, that when the writing system entered Japan, perhaps in the fifth century, all the writing styles from the ancient scripts to those developed after the invention of the sophisticated brush had been completed in China. This is a modern list of the first section of the famous thousand character classic or text made for Chinese children to memorize characters. It rhymes in Chinese. The vertical list here says, the sky was black and yellow, earth yellow, space and time vast, limitless. Tian di shuan huan yi zhou huang huang, please excuse my pronunciation. We see them vertically from right to left in six different script forms. This is an abbreviated list and it shows basic styles from ancient scripts in oracle bone on the right and bronze script followed by four script forms developed after the soft hair brush was invented. They are clerical, standard, running, and grass scripts. These are listed not in the order of chronological development, <clears throat> but are listed in the order of writing speed. This is a detail of the Burnt Sutra, the first scroll. Here we see a great example of the standard script. 
where the written language reached Japan in the fifth century, perhaps, one of the most urgent needs for the rulers of the country was an official writing for diplomatic purposes. So they first learned the most clear and legible standard script represented here in Buddhist sutra writing. As each hand scroll was rolled up, the sections where the fire touched made wave-like pattern when opened. The Sugimoto produced an astoundingly beautiful display of the surviving section of the sutra, not by toning down the burnt reality, but by emphasizing it, by using a similar color sienna yellow silk for the mounting fabric. Poetic sentiment has been discerned and elevated in this piece by ingenious mounting. This chart shows the visual differentiations of the same term, kanzeon bosatsu in Japanese. Actually, there is an extra dai or the big in the, character, the Chinese uh, characters, but uh, the two of them on the right, but kanzeon bosatsu, commonly known as the kanon uh, in, Jap in Japanese and guanin in Chinese, meaning in a Buddhist bodhisattva of compassion, is written vertically from right to left in the standard script running grass and hiragana syllabaries and katakana syllabaries. While the rulers of Japan learned to write kanji characters for semantic value, they needed to produce syllabaries to denote grammatical differences from the Chinese. By abbrevi abbreviating kanji characters, they made hiragana script, second from the left, and by taking sections of a character, they made katakana, the farthest left, blocky looking style. Now, this is a section of waka you know, anthology, traditionally attributed to Fujiwara no Sadayori, oyegire section of Kokin Wakashu, perhaps from the early 12th century. As each Chinese character or kanji has basically one pronunciation, the early Japanese made use of that approximation of that sound to match a Japanese syllable, now standardized in 47 syllables. This slide showing waka poems in a 31 syllables in rhythmic uh, reciting of 57577. The poem is preceded by a preface. It shows the height of flowing kana writing you can see the quarterly tradition of poems written in the most abbreviated kana forms in the so-called women's hand, as it was first de developed by women. It reads, see, Natsubiki no teriki no ito o kurikayashi, koto shikekuto mo taen to omou na. And if you have studied, maybe let's see, I'm not quite sure how to use this one. No. This one. The, the yeah, yeah, so I'm sorry. Yeah. So here is that. Probably if you have studied Japanese, you know, the hiragana first, then he, maybe you can recognize this na, tsu, he, or ki is a different hentaigana. Uh, but the, no. Tebiki no ito. So, so, certain way, you know, this is a very much abbreviated uh, kana script, which. Uh, the later, the Ministry of Education really took as the standard of a writing of hiragana. Uh, this means that though rumors flourish, recurring time after time, spinning out like thread, like summer hand-spun thread, do not think of ending it. <clears throat> now this is a list of Japanese 48 syllables from a to n, so this is the a, aiwe o kakikeko, going this way. The, the end is there, right? And actually, the last n is, is abnormally, so usually we call it in the 47 syllables rather than 48, but here it's 48. The list may confuse you, but the, Joshua Mosto explained the you know, better example yesterday in the larger uh, uh, um, slide, but here, the, uh, until the 20th century, when the Minister of Education sort of standardized the kana syllable forms, 
Historically, people used different kanji characters to represent one syllable. You know, for example, here's the ah, and you can see one, two, three, four. Four different kanji representing ah. And of course, that the abbreviation of that form itself is, you know, there are so many different ways of doing it, and then personal writing style, the speed and everything. So the whole thing is really very confusing, you know, <laughs> in, order to, in order to read. So just here, I want to present how much students of Japanese calligraphy must know in order to decipher all the documents. Please be sympathetic to them. <laughs> there, <there's, laughs> this is not an easy task, and yet the thrill of uncovering new information is really exciting and rewarding. So this is a you know, famous work of forms I'm sure you've seen many times, but by Kakinomoto no Hitomaro, the early Earth century, and brushed by an early 17th century calligrapher, Shokado Shoujo. This slide shows a developed stage of Japanese writing that combines Chinese characters or kanji and Japanese syllables and various choices of kana forms. Written over painted bluebells, actually painted by uh, Tawaraya Sotatsu, very famous one, you can perceive the larger and more complicated looking kanji, for example. Uh, oops. Oh, I'm just, just <laughs> the, I mean, I meant to, kaki no moto no hitomaru. Here is written in kanji, and you can see it's much more larger, you know, the forms. Uh, <clears throat> Let's see, uh, maybe could go. This slide shows how the Hitomaro's waka poem, consisting of 31 syllables, is actually written as the forms in Japanese block style on the right-hand side. The actual calligraphy is much more abbreviated, as you can see on the left. And here said, right, uh, let's see. It's a honobono to akashi no ura no that's what the, uh, it's, it's written. I wish I had the time to really explain more the details, but just I would like you to see at least the complexity of Japanese calligraphy, mixing kanji and kana and the wider range of visual choices available, combining kanji and kana taken from different kanji sources, and the level of abbreviation. Here in English, ever so faintly in the morning mist at Akashi Bay, I long for the boat that just disappeared behind the island. One of the most famous you know, poems by the poet saint, Hitomaro. So just to summarize up to this point, Along with the writing styles from the ancient scripts to kana scripts, the linguistic complexity gave Japanese calligraphy tremendous variety, more so than can be found in the calligraphy, calligraphic world of Chinese or Korean. Now, the form <coughs> and line are two major elements of calligraphy. Of course, a calligrapher's personal training and taste always distinguishes each work. Before the sophisticated brush or the calligraphy implements were invented, forms were the primary concern in writing. Some of the earliest character forms that can, be, uh, can we come across are those incised into the plastron of tortoises, in other words, the belly side of the tortoise. At least we can see the characters for numbers, one to five, and some psychical uh, dating, the lines are incised with sharp metal tools, so the lines are straighter without thick and thin variations. They have an attractive simplicity, similar to modern drawings of stick figures. This is modern ink rubbings from the Shang or ancient Shang dynasty. Uh, it's a cast inscription on bronze vessels, generally called bronze script. From top left, you can see the deer, the profile of a deer, the first quarter of the 31st century BCE. 
The pictographic beauty of the form is incredible. And the second smaller one has the bird and father Quay, perhaps the owner of the bronze vessel of the 13th to 12th century BCE. The last one is the door or the gate, but perhaps a clan name again, 11th century BCE. So pictorial representations in lines are clearly discernible. This is another example of bronze scripts cast interior of a ceremonial vessel. It was commissioned by an eminent member of the Western Zhou court. I believe, let's see, this is the, the, the person who, the person who um, commissioned for his father. It's written, this is the father, you know, the strange head. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> this uh, type of pictographic bronze script captured attention of many modern artists, including Japanese calligraphers. You know, I do not pretend to recognize many of these characters, but some forms are kept even to this day, you know, exemplified by, here's a, the king, and this is the da, you know, the man standing tall, and this is the fifth month, five, and the moon, so the fifth month. <clears throat> Here, I would like to highlight one artist named Nakabayashi Gochiku. His date is 1827 to 1913, who paid close attention to the forms of ancient scripts, bronze scripts in particular, and imbued his own poetic sentiment to his writing. Uh, let's see, so the couplets here, oh yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> here, this is, um, and yeah, no, I'm not sure that I can read this. The, um, how would it go? So, so there was a cast container uh, in use day and night. Here is the morning and the moon, but means in the day and night. And the, uh, how would it go? To uh, in, ensure, ensure the good fortune of the imperial household. <clears throat> and their sons and grandsons forever treasured it treasured using it. That's the, the, the major <coughs> main inscription, uh, the calligraphy part. Now, it's the, here it's of course you know, inscribed by the, uh, the, the, uh, the second lord of Yin, given name Dun of the Zhou dynasty, and signed Gochiku, and followed by two seals. So as, as Gochiku's date indicates. Gochiku lived through the end of the pre-modern Edo period and the new Meiji Restoration of 1868, in one of the most turbulent periods in the history of Japan. It was a time when Japan had to really squarely face the, to meet the world. The Gochiku was a samurai retainer of the Hizen province in Saga prefecture near Nagasaki in Kyushu. He had the reputation of being a child prodigy in calligraphy, and he taught calligraphy at a clan school. When all the systems of governing was abolished, a new prefectural divisions of governing body were set up, Gochiku desisted from seeking employment in the government and decided to pursue the path of an independent calligrapher and lived by the brush alone. He traveled all over Japan and at least visited China twice. He collected many calligraphic books, often of the engravings taken from scripts cast onto bronze vessels, and brought them back home. It's often said that he, his calligraphy shows pictographic sense that was rather new at that time. Among Gochiku's calligraphy in the Coles collection, we have many seals carved for his uh, brush names and some interesting phrases in kanji which often indicates his fascination and joy as a visiting famous art, visiting famous places in China. So Gojiku's interest in bronze script forms and compositions is reinforced by his tendency to play up the graphic and pictographic nature of his bronze script itself. This playfulness is particularly evident in the kanji characters for the sons, Right, you can see the sun, like the sun is really showing up, the hands up, grandson, eternity, 
and treasure. <clears throat> the basic shape of a child and son and treasure have appeared in bronze scripts numerous times. The Gotiku's contribution to the bronze scripts are the gentle tilts of his lines, observed here as if a child is raising his arms, high up, not in a rigid manner, but in a physically natural way, as if to show one's happiness and pleasure. His minimalistic use of lines without thick and thin variation, but with natural curves, give the piece a heartwarming feeling. His creativity in expressing his idea of eternity or forever is apparently in the way he conveys the visual sense of amaze, suggesting it has no ends. So, uh, this slide shows that the Gotiku's signature and seals in the couplet, we will examine them separately. <clears throat> His signature is written in a style that cannot be identified by traditional norms. <clears throat> He began drawing lines in a normal standard style or script using a brush, but instead of following usual process, he's freely making circles. We're talking about this kind of circles in the middle of it. Here's also circles. <clears throat> in fast writing styles like a grass script, many choreographers made circular motions according to the rules. Gotiku's signature looks kind of awkward because the strict brush drawing in the standard script abruptly changes to making circles. His seal for his name, Gotiku, shows his clear interest in the pictographic nature on the on seal script. So this slide shows Gotiku's three seals. From right is the Gotiku, his name in the center is I waved my sleeve at the Great Wall, where he visited in 1883. The left is, I washed my feet in the angry tide of the Jar River. So Gotiku's you know, two seals, the one at the center and the left, affixed below his signature tell us his happy and proud journey to the Great Wall and the Jar River in China. One has straight lines, the one in the center, and the other has curvier lines. In terms of form and line, Gotiku tapped into the beauty of ancient script forms, and he made lines imbued with excitement derived from his personal experiences. Now, this is a, by a Soejima Taneomi, and it is an ex excerpt, his calligraphy is an excerpt from Dentoroku a biography of great Zen masters written in Chinese during the Sun Dynasty, 1004. The calligrapher, Soichima Taneomi, is a very famous Meiji statesman. He was a good friend and a patron of Gochiku. He was another great innovator of new calligraphic style. His calligraphy and seals are even more advanced in ignoring conventional calligraphic rules. A, that can be seen, for example, in the way he placed the largest a character called here <clears throat> at the lower left, where normally empty space is left as breathing space. The calligraphic output of those two men, Gochiku and Soejima, reflects the conflict between the old and the new, between pres preservation and innovation. Both of the tendencies stem from the same love of the country facing imminent threat to its safety and security. Wojciku was determined to preserve the art of calligraphy as a national art, while Suejima was anxious to ensure national security by following the footsteps of modern Western societies. So these three are Soejima's seals. From the right, his pseudonym, you know, Taneomi. The center is poetic phrase. It said, poetic nurturing remains forever between heaven and earth. So you can see probably heaven and earth is in between. Probably you can see 
if you know character to quite quite well. And the left is always a learner. It is said ichi ichi gaku jin. The last example shows his witty choice of character forms in abundant space. Now here we have six free verse poems written vertically from right. The first selected free verse poem, the one on the extreme right. Well, <laughs> sorry. This one I'm talking about, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, he said, arranging flowering cherry goes like this. I'm sorry, this was done by the Kawahigashi Hekigoto, uh, the great artist, uh, calligrapher and poet and artist. He says, Sakura, let's see, maybe I can see. Yeah. Sakura iketa, hana kuzu no naka kara, hito eda hirou. <coughs> I arranged a blossoming cherry branch, picking it up from fallen ones. So Kawahigashi Hekigoto is another innovative artist of the 20th century, breaking through the traditional poem poetic formula of haiku, of which stanza normally goes five, seven, five, altogether 17 syllables. This particular example consists of six, nine, seven, not following the haiku formula. His calligraphy is also very unconventional, going against pretty and flowing clean lines, but seeking the total opposite. As you can see, his lines are blotchy, and in fact, his choice of many forms is made of dots rather than lines. Instead of drawing a line, he often made in sort of uh, application of dots, short lines so that without drawing lines, you know, just kind of dot, right? Made of, <clears throat> okay. And it, let's see, there's so many of them. So, uh, two of other poems, five poems, go like this. Yoru no kehai, ayu wa ikimi no subitashi chō. Nightly mood, trout as fresh as alive, with intestine dipped in vinegar. That's what, <laughs> the next one it says, Koyoi tomaran ashi itawaritsu, momiji nureitsu. Let us stay tonight taking care of our legs as maple leaves have fallen drenched. So he doesn't want to go out in the rain. So here again, you know, concentrating on the first poem on the right on cherry blossoms, he says, I arranged a blossoming cherry branch, picking it up, from fallen ones. So he's sympathetic to the underdog. You know, he, is in, uh, he ignores the established flower arrangement and picks it up from a cherry, no, the thrown cherry branch. Now here is the Hegoto's, uh, uh, by the way, Hegigoto means Sultan's uh, parasol tree. That's the, the name of his, uh, the meaning. And his signature for heki, of hekigoto, meaning deep blue. And visually here, the consists of dots. And his seal is not intaglio, but character forms are incised. Now the photographer named Shinichi Maruyama, Active in New York, made a number of incredible calligraphy works made of water and ink-based images. He has them photographed using modern technology, taking 7,500 images per second, or even more. <clears throat> this image, calligraphy in the sky, is one of them. And it resembles Enso in uh, Zen, Zen context, a sign of nothingness. So this photo shows the process of him making calligraphy in the sky. Many photographs he took are incredibly beautiful and mind-boggling, but here is my interest. Imagine this three-dimensional calligraphy embedded into or onto a two-dimensional paper. You know, calligraphy should be considered in three-dimensional terms. That much power is actually condensed into a sheet of paper. 
So whenever I have a chance to speak about the calligraphy to my students, I refer to this image so they will not dismiss calligraphy as an old art unfit to the current art world. We ought to really define what lines mean in calligraphy or in calligraphic art. There are so many great calligraphic works in the Coles collection. But this shout, or the cuts, is one of the most memorable works, especially among those in the contemporary group. Maruyama threw the ink in the air. Yuichi, meanwhile, attacked the treated frozen paper with the ink while shouting out loud. There are video that show, videos show how he attacks the paper with a great shout. He experienced near death in Fukagawa, downtown Tokyo, in the 10th of March in 1945. The intense American bombing in, of Tokyo. Three quarters of the city center was destroyed that day. The school where he took refuge burned down. He survived after hours of resuscitation. As his life was spared while others perished, you know where Yuichi began making calligraphy with all his might. This shout reminds us of you know, Shiraga Kazuo's body art from the Gutai group, avant-garde art. Yuichi actually joined the Gutai group, headed by Yoshara Jiro in 1954, which advocated the liber liberation of calligraphy, the cons constraints of lexicon and meaning. After understanding these influences, he went on to produce a number of big characters like this. This one is 1961, communicating his vision of the world in single word. This slide shows the detail of the left side of the character shout, which actually shows the form of an open mouth. A tiny seal is affixed at the lower right edge. Actually, I have not figured out what the seal says. It looks like the face of a monkey. Let us know if anyone knows how, what it says. There are so many outstanding calligraphic pieces in this exhibition that I wish I could have highlighted more of them. They include literary art by Taiga, Jikuden, Rai Sanyo, and from Zen Milyu, those by Ikkyu, Hakuin, Rokan. None of them I could show it today. It is you know, easy for visitors to leave out looking at calligraphers' signatures and seals, particularly seals, as they are not easy to read. I trust this brief presentation provided some inspiration on the special uh, no, seal scripts that, in fact, had the longest history of developing forms in calligraphy. Modern artists went back to the ancient scripts on oracle bones and cast characters, and they instilled their idiosyncratic emotions and thoughts into their calligraphic forms and lines. Calligraphic art is international, just like music. Calligraphy shows, allows for so many, uh, so much improvisation. It is an exciting field. When you are puzzled by a calligraphy facing, dissect the forms, think of lines, and then how they interact or reject each other. The course collection contains Japanese calligraphy written entirely in kanji or entirely in kana in variation, as well as a mixture of the two scripts. And they are often accompanied by artist's signature and seals. These calligraphies not only pictorialize the intricate linguistic components of Japan's written language in all of its complexity and expressive beauty, but also captivate and hold our attention as outstanding works of visual art. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Sadako-san. That was very interesting to me. Um, I myself is interested in revival of ancient forms in mm. uh, modern times. And uh, I really liked uh, your presentation of it. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit 
And then I was thinking about when you are presenting the history of uh, Japanese calligraphy in 20 minutes, that uh, the standard script itself that made me think that the point standard script become standard. And I was wondering, my hunch was there was late Edo, and I was wondering there was a part of revival of the ancient form that goes back to Han Dynasty. I mean, it's a little bit complicated mm -hmm. question, but I wonder if you have any yeah. thoughts on that. Okay, so the, uh, the standard script, as I mentioned, you know, when the calligraphy or the written language uh, came to Japan and definitely needed to have to communicate with the uh, other countries or the, among themselves as well in written form. So they definitely show, chose the uh, kaisho, you know, easiest, clearest one first. And that is definitely. But in, in China, actually, the, I think I had the, the, uh, some of the development of the historical things. Kaisho is really one of the last ones really to be <laughs> developed. You know, they had this lishu, the, the clerical script was a, uh, in the brush writing. And uh, uh, the, so the development of the, after the brush was invented, development of those characters were quite mingled up, mixed up, and uh, not really in coming in their order. Um, but in Japan, the, uh, the, you know, just probably about the time of Ike no Taiga, my dissertation man, okay. <laughs> of the, 17, uh, the 18th century, mid 18th century, they definitely started taking interest in seal script. And I didn't, uh, I guess we didn't have this uh, Taiga's seal script, yeah. but at that time in you know, Kofuyo yeah. is the, one of the sort of what is a more standard or the, the clear uh, orthodox style of seal carving. Uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure they were influenced by the Ming Dynasty, uh, that's a, a calligraphic, um, the seal script, which was brought over to Japan by you know, the, the, the books. And uh, the meaning that like Taiga himself is actually had more um, uh, the pictographic styles also, you know, he's really pretty, um, the, uh, very much interested in and had this great uh, talent of making picto pictographic uh, writing as well, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, sorry, just a little bit of follow up. I was wondering when, when sort of um, you start to see standard script as a form of art, as in a hanging scroll, rather than a correspondence between China and Japan in ancient time. So if, if that, well, uh, we, like Maki Ryoko did, uh, Maki Ryoko yes, yes. did very beautiful um, standard script Mm. Uh, calligraphy. Oh, I so I was wondering when the standard script become sort of art form in a hang, it, hanging scroll rather than communicating purposes. You know, actually, that the, the uh, already the time of the eighth century, the there uh, in Buddhist sutras. That's what we you know seen today. So this actually from the very beginning that the. Uh, in the standard script, uh, the calligraphy written in the standard script, I'm sure there's already a um, hmm, art form, we can say, but then uh, they had to start writing in the hiragana and you know, the more of a waka poems, then it's a mixture. Well, actually, the Joshua mentioned hentai gana and the manyo gana. I avoided that term because it's <laughs> so complicated, you know. So that's <laughs> uh, avoided in my talk. But um, let's see. Ah, okay. So uh, the, from among the Zen monks, Muromachi period, definitely there is a uh, standard script 
a calligraphic, artistic calligraphy is definitely there already. Is that good enough? Yeah? Okay. Thank you.